Today on Personal Injury Court. You are suing for $1.2 million. We come and hit this tent, and we immediately fall out, bounce off, and hit the ground. You all could have been killed out there. We could have oh, been. I thought I was dead. This is the hardware in your back. I can't even make love to my own husband. They were hurt because they were hanging off the side of the basket when this all took place. Ultimately, they're responsible for pins in their back and the fact that we're they, responsible they can't for make back. love anymore. Wow. Folks, Maybe you need We're going to have love. order in the court. Judge Gino Brogdon spent 10 years on the bench ruling on cases worth billions of dollars. Now he presides over some of the largest claims in TV history. This is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Simon versus Nelson. Mr. and Mrs. Simon, it's my understanding that you're suing Mr. Nelson and his company, Magic in the Air. It's a hot air balloon company. You all sustain severe injuries while riding in his hot air balloon. You're asking this court to award you medical bills of $275,000, lost wages of $75,000, emotional distress of $350,000, pain and suffering of $500,000 for a total award of $1.2 million. Is that correct? Yes, yes Your Honor. Honor. And Mr. Nelson, you believe that had they heeded your safety instructions while they were in your balloon, they never would have been hurt. This is their fault. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, well, let's get into the legal sauce. What led y'all to want to ride in a hot air balloon? Well, Your Honor, um, we've been married for about eight years now. He's my high school sweetheart. Um, we've been in love since the first day that I met him. And we're kind of a outgoing bunch. He's my thing one, I'm his thing two. And we just love to have a good time. We like to grab life by the horns and just be adventurous, you know? What other kinds of things have y'all done other than riding hot air balloons? Well, last year for our anniversary, we went skydiving. The year before that, I think we did rock climbing, and it's just Scuba always diving, been... diving, everything. We're, we're that couple. Like, our lives is very, very active. We are doing something every week. That's something that's always fun. Y'all sound like thrill seekers, though. Oh, yeah. So, Mr. Nelson, tell me about magic in the air. Well, Your Honor, I have a very successful hot air balloon service. Um, I've been in business successfully for 25 years now. We've got a strong online presence. Uh, if you look at our website, you'll see all kinds of reviews that are positive and reinforcing with respect to the kind of customer service that we provide. Some of our customers come back two, three, four, five times they come back to fly. So we at uh, Magic in the Air, we, we feel like we're trying to create a magical experience, not just a hot air balloon ride. You ever had anybody get hurt before this incident? No, as a matter of fact, we haven't had any kind of incident with respect to this. Years. So Mr. and Mrs. Simon, tell me what happened. It was a beautiful day. You know, um, we were super excited. Uh, I, the night before, I went and purchased a camera because I wanted to capture every moment. I want to take a million and one pictures, as I always do. So we get onto the hot air balloon, and we decide, we just start kind of ascending in the mm -hmm. air. And as soon as we take off, a huge gust of wind just comes out of nowhere, and we go right into this tent, and it tumbles us over. We fly into the tent and down, face on the ground. You all actually came out of the basket? Came out of the basket and hit the ground. We, we hit the ground like, like rag dolls, Your Honor. Like, just imagine, we bounce off the tent and then just like, on the ground. And this you know, is from, like, a, about a good 30 feet in the air. You all could have been killed out there. We could have oh, been. I thought I was dead. I couldn't move. My back was in pain. This is my the kind of stuff people dream about or have nightmares about, really. Yeah, yes, and, you know, and we're used to doing fun stuff. And it's like, how could this have happened to us on our anniversary? Like, this day will never be the same. I will always remember that day as the day that we almost died. So, Mr. Nelson, how does this kind of thing happen? Well, um... To be honest with you, Your Honor, uh, we were having an eventful day that day, and, and uh, we were celebrating our anniversary as well as the Simons celebrating theirs. Tell me about your anniversary. Which one was it? It was our 25th anniversary okay. in business. And, and um, normally what I do at the beginning of the ride, before we ascend, I give the instructions, and I did that day just like I always do. Now, I had told them both that what they needed to do was to stay in the center of the gondola. And that's the basket that's up underneath the hot air balloon. Yep. Your Honor, who stands in a, in a hot air balloon to stand in the center of the balloon? No one uh, does that. Maybe people who are told to stand there. There you go. There you go, yes. Okay. 
Now, you see how big Sheriff Matt is. Would he be standing in the middle? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure him nicely, him yeah, up, but... I guess he would. <laughs> But you give the same instructions to everyone. Yes, oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I have to, otherwise it's not going to work. And, and also, not any sudden movements at that point in time. Okay. Well, they obviously weren't listening because as I ascended, they immediately ran to one side of the gondola. They leaned we over the not, side. We did not They run. leaned the over wind, the side and the they started taking... Trust me, Miss Simon, please. They started taking pictures as they're leaning over the side. Now I'm screaming. As you're taking off. Yeah, and I'm screaming and hollering for them to get back into position, and they just totally ignored me. They Mr. just Mr. stayed. Mr. Simon, did, did you all hear Mr. Nelson saying, "Stand in the middle, don't go to the edge, Your don't Honor, make any sudden movement"? We couldn't movement. hear anything because it was so loud. And as soon as we ascended, the gust of wind came out of nowhere, which caused us to move in the gondola. The problem is, we were way too close to the tent. He doesn't want to admit it. We were way entirely too close to that tent. Mr. and Mrs. Simon, you all submitted an exhibit to explain this. Yes, sir. I want you to take me through it. We'll yes, put it up on the uh, plasma here. Take your time, Miss Simon. Thank you. Coming up. As soon as we ascend off the ground, the gust of wind comes out of nowhere and we come and hit this tent. I remember hearing a crack in my hip. I remember hearing the break. I thought I was dying in that moment. I'm sorry, can I? Can you can I please do sit whatever down? makes you comfortable. If you need to sit down Thank in you, your wheelchair, Honor. take your time. In order to understand how this balloon works from a physics perspective, the court has consulted physics expert Katie Lowry. The balloon basically rises diagonally toward the tent and ultimately collides with the tent. As soon as we take off, a huge gust of wind just comes out of nowhere. We fly into the tent and down. We, we hit the ground like, like rag dolls, Your Honor, just like, on the ground. You all submitted an exhibit to explain this. Yes, sir. I want you to take me through it. As soon as we ascend off the ground, the gust of wind comes out of nowhere, and we come and hit this tent. Right at the tip of it, it tips us over, and we immediately fall out, bounce off, and hit the ground face first. It's the worst experience I've ever experienced in my life. I almost fell out as well. And the point is, Your Honor, they not only endangered their lives, but they endangered my lives and, and the lives of the people on the ground. Well, you realize you weren't hurt and they were badly hurt, Exactly. Right? You yeah. don't have any yeah, because injuries. They were hurt because they were hanging off the side of the basket when this all took place. This would not have happened had they stayed in place. No, exactly. That's my point. As you can see from this diagram, Your Honor, the wind basically took control of the hot air balloon. So you weren't trying to go to the edge and take pictures? No, sir. And we're, as you can see, we were way too close to this tent. Miss Simon, you may come back to the podium. Take your time. Now, Mr. Simon, you've been quiet like a good husband. <laughs> He's yes, an amazing Honor. husband. Tell me what you remember about this incident. I feel like I don't remember much of the fall, much of the bounce. I remember hearing a crack in my hip. I remember hearing the break. I remember not knowing if that was my break because the pain I was in or the break of my wife. I didn't know if I was going to see her again. I didn't know if I was going to see, see again, period, myself. I thought I was dying in that moment. Let me, let me tell you what's making me ticklish. It takes a lot of discipline to stay in the middle of that basket until you get to the right height. I could see myself running to the edge, right? We were just trying to get to a certain point to where we can get good pictures. I automatically saw... That sounds that like you're walking toward the edge, though. No, I mean, in standing in the gondola, we wanted to see the views. And we we're trying to get to a certain level that we can see all of that. And, Your Honor, nobody that... said they couldn't see that. I just told them during the liftoff to stay centered. Once we got up there, certainly they would well, be able to move more to the perimeter. How high are you supposed to get before they can move from the center? OK, as a licensed pilot of hot air balloons, I have to be certified in certain meteorological uh, areas. Yes, sir. And uh, we don't have an engine in a hot air balloon. All we have is the wind. That's what controls our moving forward and backward and from side to side. On that particular day, it was a great day, weather-wise. There was like a slight four mile an hour wind out of the northwest, but that's insignificant. That's nothing for a hot air balloon. That's a good day to fly, isn't it, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, definitely. And he's supposed to be an expert. And it's his job to make sure that we're safe. 
That's not completely correct under the law. The law requires Mr. Nelson to act reasonably to reduce the risk of harm, not to ensure that you're not harmed. Next. I actually have a broken back. I have permanently rod. I'm in sorry, my... but you're responsible. Oh, oh you're oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's the first time you said sorry. Miss Simon, please address me. Thank you, Miss Lowry, for being with us. Can you explain the physics behind how this accident happened? The balloon would have risen 50 feet vertically, barely, barely missing the tent. With the gust of wind, it absolutely would have basically collided with the tent, and there's absolutely no way you could have avoided a collision. They started taking pictures as they're leaning over the side. Now I'm as screaming. As you're taking off. Yeah. The wind basically took control of the hot air balloon. Mr. Nelson, you knew what the wind was like that day, right? Exactly. And but you're supposed to anticipate what the wind is going to be. That was a shearing wind that came across. And this was what I call a perfect storm. Okay. It was the Simons crossing to the side of the gondola, All leaning right. over the side, okay. tilting the basket, where the flame, the burner, could not ignite the, the uh, balloon. If they had not moved to the edge, even with the wind, this wouldn't have happened? No, of course not. No, they would have never fallen out. Mr. Never... and Mrs. Simon, you all submitted $275,000 in past medical bills. Yes, sir. I see that you're asking the court for $75,000 for lost wages. We haven't worked in weeks since the since incident because we've been in the hospital. So y'all not working, you're trying to heal up. And we're going to be out three more months because we have to have rehab. I actually have a broken back that I have to now, I, I have permanently rods I'm in sorry, my... but you're responsible. Oh, oh, oh you're oh, sorry, Mr. Now. Mr. That's the first time you've said sorry. That's the first time you've said sorry. Ms. Simon, please address me. You submitted this uh, diagram from your doctor. This is the hardware in your back. They put these rods in to stabilize all those levels. I can't even make love to my own husband. <sighs> Simple things that I'm, I'm, I'm used to doing, I can't do anymore. It's hard to even sleep. And that's and why I... you're asking this court for $500,000 for your pain and suffering and $350,000 for emotional distress. Mr. Simon, you broke off the top of your femur. You need a hip replacement. Yes, You've got Your got your arm in a sling. What were your other injuries? My hip, my pelvis, Your Honor, and my... I'm sorry, can I... You can, can I please do whatever my... makes you comfortable. If you need to sit down Thank in you, your, your wheelchair. Take your time. Oh. Thank you, Your Honor. The pain has been nonstop since, since the accident. We can't do things like walk our dog. Your Honor, I, you know what? I, I have sympathy for what has happened to them, but I, I can't take blame for this. It's not my fault. I mean, ultimately, they're responsible for pins in their back and the fact that we're they, responsible they can't for pins make in love back. anymore. Wow. Folks, Maybe you need we're going to have love. order in the court. In order to understand how this balloon works from a physics perspective, the court has consulted physics expert Katie Lowry. Sheriff, will you bring Miss Lowry in to talk to us about these hot air balloons? Yes, sure. Thank you, Miss Lowry, for being with us. Can you explain the physics behind how this accident happened? Yes, so I brought along uh, a model with me today. And upon ascent, the balloon will rise at approximately three feet per second. Um, the day of the incident, the wind was traveling at four miles per hour northwest, and it was causing the balloon basically to go horizontally. So when you combine those two together, the balloon basically rises diagonally toward the tent and ultimately collides with the tent. But Mr. Nelson talked about this sudden gust of wind, this uh, shearing wind. How does that play in this? So at the balloon launch site, it's approximately 100 feet from the tent. And taking those wind speeds into consideration, even without the gust of wind, the balloon would have risen 50 feet vertically, barely, barely missing the tent. With the gust of wind, it absolutely would have basically collided with the tent, and there's absolutely no way you could have avoided a collision. Your Honor. Entirely Mr. Nelson, too close. is 100 feet appropriate? Yes, it's more than appropriate if, in fact, they were not hanging off the side of the gondola. She's not taking that into consideration. I think I've heard what I need to hear. I'm ready to render my decision.
verdict is in. You all say you stayed in the middle and you hit the tent, it tipped you out of the basket and you were nearly killed. Mr. Nelson, you don't think it's your fault. One, because you had a wind come at you that was unexpected and they moved to the edge of the basket, tipped it just as you hit that tent. The wind basically took control of the hot air balloon. If they had not moved to the edge, this wouldn't have happened? No, of course not. At the balloon launch site, it's approximately 100 feet from the tent, and there's absolutely no way you could have avoided a collision. In every personal injury case, the plaintiffs, Mr. and Mrs. Simon, you all have to prove that the defendant committed a wrong that caused your harm. Your harm is undisputed. There are allegations that you all went to the side of the basket and made it tip. You all say you stayed in the middle and you hit the tent, it tipped you out of the basket and you were nearly killed. This should not have happened this way and you all should have had a happy anniversary. Mr. Nelson, you agree that this should not have happened this way, but you don't think it's your fault. One, because you had a wind come at you that was unexpected and they moved to the edge of the basket, tipped it just as you hit that tent. You don't have a problem with being 100 feet from the tent as a clearance for takeoff. No, Your Honor. Well, we always have to turn to the law. Hot air balloons are no different than buses, trucks. When you carry people for hire, you're recognized as a common carrier. Now, the law places an extraordinary burden to avoid negligence on a common carrier because you take away people's opportunity to protect themselves. The law says is if you're slightly negligent, you're responsible. This court is taking judicial notice of the federal law that applies to hot air balloon operation. And the handbook for the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration that granted you your license, says as follows, the balloon should be placed as far as possible upwind from any obstructions to flight, such as power lines, trees, buildings, things of that sort, using a minimum of 100 feet of clearance for every knot of wind. Now, I did the calculations. Mr. Nelson, you should have been at least 350 feet from these tents. And because you must avoid even slight negligence as a common carrier, I must find against you and in the Simon's favor for everything they are Thank seeking you. from this court. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Simon, I am going to award you your past medical bills of $275,000 your lost wages of $75,000, every bit of your emotional distress for $350,000, and all of your pain and suffering of $500,000 for a total award of $1.2 million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is my final verdict, Thank and this you. matter is adjourned. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Personal injury court. So a piece of this kind of material yeah. actually got into your eyeball. I felt this loud crash. A piece of the plate just burst into my eyeball. Oh. It sliced my face open. She'll have permanent vision loss. You're suing for $140,000. She knew there was going to be plate smashing. It was written on the wedding invitation. She should have removed herself. What should have been an exciting event for you really turned into a nightmare. Judge Gino Brogdon spent 10 years on the bench ruling on cases worth billions of dollars. Now he presides over some of the largest claims in TV history. This is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Morris versus Papadopoulos. 
Ms. Morris, based on the documents you filed with this court, it's my understanding you are suing Mr. Papadopoulos for injuries that you received while you were at his restaurant during a wedding. You're asking this court to award you $25,000 for your past medical expenses, $15,000 for your future medical expenses, $100,000 for pain and suffering for a total award of $140,000, right? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Papadopoulos, you believe that Ms. Morris knew what she was getting into, any injuries she has, they're because she assumed the risk of those based on what was happening. So this is not your fault, right? Yes, Your Honor. All right, well, let's get into the legal sauce. What led you to this wedding? Your Honor, I'm a real estate agent, and my face is my calling card. I was at a wedding reception at Apollo's, and what was supposed to be a joyous and happy occasion turned into tragedy, and I ended up in the emergency room. Tell me about your restaurant, Mr. Papadopoulos. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm the owner and operator of an authentic Greek restaurant, Apollo's Taverna. Outside of Greece, we have the best spagnacopita and musica in the world. Now, do you host a lot of wedding receptions? Yes, we do, Your Honor. Indeed. Um, I am a second-generation Greek. Uh, my family is from the island of Crete. My parents, God rest their souls, opened up the restaurant Apollo's Taverna. So, Ms. Morris, tell me about this wedding and how your eye was injured. Your Honor, one of my clients invited me to his wedding. The wedding was held at a really nice Greek Orthodox church. It was beautiful. But afterwards, the reception was held at Apollo's Taverna. And I can't complain. The food was amazing. Thank the you. The place was beautiful. I brought a date with me and we were having a great time. But as the night progressed, everybody started drinking. There was a lot of wine. It got very rowdy. Weddings and, can be that way. Yeah. <laughs> and they started to do the traditional Greek smashing of the plates in the, middle of the, in the middle of the floor and everything. Your Honor, I had never been to a Greek wedding before. So this was the first for me. So I got up from where I was sitting and I went to take a picture. I was curious. I've never been to this. So when I got closer, all of a sudden, I felt this loud crash on the right side of my face and a piece of the plate just burst into my eyeball. Oh! It sliced my face open. Oh. There was blood everywhere. It was the worst feeling ever. My face felt like it was on fire, like it was burning. Oh. My date that was with me had to pick me up and take me straight to the emergency room. So a piece of a plate hit your actual eyeball? A shard of it went into my eyeball, yes. Mr. Papadopoulos, that's not how a wedding reception is supposed to turn out, right? No, Your Honor. Well, how is this supposed to happen? Well, let me tell you, plate smashing is a time-honored tradition, especially at Greek weddings. Centuries ago, they would smash a plate to trick the evil spirits into thinking that the people were angry and mad instead of celebrating. Today, we smash plates at weddings to symbolize the married couple letting go of their past life and moving forward into their new life together. So at this wedding reception, it was no different than any other that we have. We smash plates. It was a request of the bridal party. Your Honor, we simply I honor researched the request. This. May I finish, please? We're gonna have order in this court. Y'all can't talk to each other. You talk to me. I understand the importance of the tradition, but someone nearly lost an eye. Why wouldn't that be your fault? Well, Your Honor, she knew there was going to be plate smashing at the time of the reception. It was open and obvious. It was written on the wedding invitation in black and white that there will be plate smashing, number one. Number two, I made an announcement prior to the reception and the plate smashing that there would be plate smashing. She was fully aware she should have taken responsibility for herself if she had any concerns of her own welfare. She should have removed herself from the reception. Well, under the law, that's an open and obvious danger, setting aside any other facts. Why wouldn't you know the danger? Your Honor, I had never been to a Greek wedding before. But you've read was... an invitation before, yes, right? Yes, Your Honor. But I did some research on this, and now the Greek weddings what they throw are napkins and flowers. They do not do plate smashing anymore. But Ms. Morris, he did a, an announcement at the beginning and said there will be plate smashing, not flowers and napkins, right? 
Why didn't you just get up and get out of there? Your Honor, I was under the impression that the plate smashing was just going to be in one area. And one of his waiters walked around and there were smashing plates everywhere. I had no idea that that's how plate smashing went. I had never been to a wedding like this, Your Honor. See, under the law, open and obvious dangers don't need a warning because everyone can see it's danger, right? I didn't know. And this is a very important tradition, right? Yes, she should have removed herself knowing that that was going to take part. Or maybe you should have removed her and anybody else that didn't want to get hit with a plate. But... Coming up. Your Honor, we use plaster plates. These plates are for the ceremony. Yes. Okay. And Your Honor, the plate that hit my eye was a piece of a ceramic plate. To understand the difference between a ceramic plate and a plaster plate, this court has consulted a ceramicist. A plaster plate, when it breaks, the edges are soft and rounded. A ceramic plate, edges will be like glass. They'll be sharp and jagged. A piece of the plate just burst into my eyeball. Oh! I made an announcement that there would be plate smashing. Mr. Papadopoulos, when this is done right, what kind of plate are you supposed to use? Your Honor, we use plaster plates. Okay. In fact, I have a photo. Sheriff, will you get this photograph? This is a photograph of a carton of plaster plates that we buy from my restaurant supplier. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Morris, did you see who threw the plate? His waiters were all drunk that night. They my, were drinking and taking shots. My waiters don't drink on the job, Your Honor. Your Honor, Samantha. the plate that hit my eye was a piece of a ceramic plate. I have proof of it. Show me. This is a piece of the ceramic plate that hit my eye. Sheriff Matt, will okay. you get that piece in of the, the plate? In the middle of everything that was happening, I was able to pick that up and put it in a napkin. I brought it in for you today. And it's actually in the picture. So a piece of this kind of material yes. actually got into your eyeball. Yes, Your Honor. It was your extremely Honor, painful. Man. Mr. Papadopoulos, your folks aren't supposed to be throwing these plates, right? Exactly. What I think happened is one of the dinner guests accidentally picked up one of the dinner plates, a ceramic plate, and threw that by mistake. And I can't be able to be responsible for something Talk to me. Did. I'm sorry, sir. Talk to me. I'm, I'm so sorry. That's clear enough, right? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Please talk yes. to me. I cannot be held responsible for something that one of my dinner guests did at the wedding. But Honor, if one of your employees is throwing it, you understand that you're responsible. I did not see any of my employees throwing a ceramic plate. We have none of the waiters seeing anybody throwing a ceramic plate. There are no eyewitnesses to any of my people throwing a ceramic plate. To understand the difference between a ceramic plate and a plaster plate, this court has consulted a ceramicist. Miss hmm. Daphne Dale. Sheriff, will you get Miss Daphne Dale in the courtroom? Yes, Your Honor. How are you, Miss Dale? I'm good, Your Honor. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been discussing the difference between a plaster plate and a ceramic plate. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? First of all, a plaster plate is never fired in a kiln, meaning it still has moisture in it and it's still very porous. So when it breaks, the edges are soft and rounded. A ceramic plate will be fired in a kiln and so the edges will be like glass. They'll be sharp and jagged, just like glass. Can you demonstrate how they come apart when they're shattered? Absolutely. All right. Next. First, I'll break the plaster plate. And next, I'll break the ceramic plate. As you can see, there's quite a bit of difference between the two shards. Well, this court has consulted Dr. Tamika Walker-Blake. That laceration severed her lacrimal or tear duct system. And if you don't make tears, your cornea could be affected. And that could en end up with permanent vision loss. Well, with these kinds of injuries, what's Ms. Morris's prognosis? This is a piece of the ceramic plate that hit my eye. Your Honor, we use plaster plates. To understand the difference between a ceramic plate and a plaster plate, this court has consulted a ceramicist. Can you demonstrate how they come apart when they're shattered? Absolutely. 
Now, which one are you going to throw first? First, I'll break the plaster plate. And next, I'll break the ceramic plate. As you can see, there's quite a bit of difference between the two shards. The plaster one is quite soft and rounded on the edges. The ceramic one is a lot more like glass. It's quite sharp and quite dangerous. Ooh. Right, thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you. Thank you are you. released. Yeah. Ms. Morris, you're asking this court to award you $25,000 for your past medical expenses and $15,000 for your future medical expenses. Tell me about your injuries. Your Honor, I suffered severe eye injuries. I think she's I lost exaggerating. My, I lost my peripheral vision. Ho hold on for a minute. You do realize that this young lady got an injury to her eye, maybe a permanent injury. I, I am very sorry. Well, one thing I'm not going to stand for in this courtroom is an insult or you being dismissive. Yes, You understand I haven't made my decision yet. You might want to hold off on that kind of attitude. <laughs> Ms. Morris, tell me about your injuries. Your Honor, I cannot see. I can't drive a car right now. I can't sell my houses anymore. I can't, I can't even go to the grocery store of having people look at me. I have severe lacerations on my face, and I'm going to have to have ongoing surgeries. I want to understand the nature of her injuries from a medical perspective. So this court has consulted Dr. Tamika Walker-Blake. She's an emergency room physician. Sheriff Matt, will you get Dr. Walker Blake in the courtroom? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good day, doctor. Good day. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Can you explain the nature of the plaintiff's injuries? So the plates had suffered a inner eyelid laceration. That laceration severed her lacrimal or tear duct system, oh. which affects the eye's ability to make tears. Oh. So what's done to repair this injury? An ophthalmologist performs surgery where they'll place a stent or a tiny tube to repair that duct and allow the eye's ability to make tears again. Tears are very important to the health of your eyes. It helps to decrease infection. It helps to clean your eyes. And if you don't make tears, your cornea could be affected. And that could en end up with permanent vision loss. Ooh. Well, with these kinds of injuries, what's Ms. Morris's prognosis? So there is a 70% chance, approximately, she'll have a full recovery. But however, there's always a chance she'll have permanent eye problems. Doctor, thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. you. You are released. Thank you. Ms. Morris, your face is pale as you listen to this testimony. What should have been an exciting event for you really turned into a nightmare. It did, Your Honor. It did. Ms. Morris, you've shared this shard with us today. I'm looking at it. It's clear that this kind of glass cut your eye. Yes. How do you know that it was not another guest? Your Honor, I have proof. I have a photo evidence. Sheriff Matt, will you get the photograph? The waiter that threw it. That was actually provided to me from my, my, one of my customers, a client that I attended the wedding to, and he provided that picture for me. He was drunk. Multiple people saw him. And as you can see, he's holding a ceramic plate because it shines in the light. It's a is, ceramic plate, it's not plaster. Mr. Papadopoulos, is that gentleman in the back with a ceramic plate one of your employees? The verdict is in. You put up evidence today that you go to a wedding reception. This one went wrong because one of Mr. Papadopoulos' employees smashed a ceramic plate and a shard went into your eye and changed your life forever. Mr. Papadopoulos, you believe this is fairly simple. She's coming to a Greek wedding. The tradition is to smash the plates. You believe it's her fault because she knew what was going to happen at the wedding? Folks, I think I've heard what I need to hear. I'm ready to render my decision. I felt this loud crash. It's clear that this kind of glass cut your eye. Yeah. How do you know that it was not another guest? Your Honor, I have proof. I have photo evidence. Mr. Papadopoulos, is that gentleman in the back with a ceramic plate one of your employees? That is one of my employees, Your Honor, but, but I don't know. I, 
I don't know if, if he was just posing for a picture that somebody was taking. I mean, I can't even tell if that's a ceramic plate. There's a rim on that plate. Wouldn't it be this kind of plate? Uh, yes, Your Honor, but like I said, I don't know that that was ever thrown. Folks, I think I've heard what I need to hear. I'm ready to render my decision. In every personal injury case, the plaintiff, you, Ms. Morris, you've got to prove three things. You've got to prove that Mr. Papadopoulos or one of his employees were wrong, that their wrong caused your harm. Yes. Your harm is beyond dispute. I'm not going to address that because it is clear that you've had a terrible injury. You've put up evidence today that you go to a wedding reception, you expect to have fun, see folks get married. It's all happy when it goes right. Mm -hmm. But this one went wrong because one of Mr. Papadopoulos' employees smashed a ceramic plate and a shard went into your eye and changed your life forever. Mr. Papadopoulos, you believe this is fairly simple. She's coming to a Greek wedding. The tradition is to smash the plates and the plates were smashed. She got hit in the eye and you don't believe it's sufficient proof that one of your employees threw a ceramic plate sending shards around the room but most of all, you believe it's her fault because she knew what was going to happen at the wedding? Well, this is very simple in terms of the law. Family traditions, societal traditions, they are very important because they mark big events in our lives. But whether you're jumping the broom or shooting a shotgun off in the 4th of July or carrying someone on your shoulders at a wedding reception, those are all potentially dangerous activities and the law says regardless of the occasion, you must be safe. And if you're gonna engage in dangerous activities, you must protect the people around you. Here, this is a dangerous activity throwing plaster or ceramic. And I saw no evidence that you, Mr. Papadopoulos, put safety measures in, either making sure your employees were not throwing plates or making sure that customers were out of the zone of danger. When you don't protect your customers, you are responsible under the law. And therefore, I find in your favor, Ms. Morris, I'm going to award you $25,000 for your past medical expenses, $15,000 for your future medical expenses, and every penny of your pain and suffering of $100,000 for a total award of $140,000 against the defendant. That is my final award, and this matter is adjourned.